Mr. We got Mr. Baller, bro. Um, this uh, this must be the worst day to die. Top three places you can't go. I got people went in the way. Digging sounds. All right, man. We got the video, man. Oh, this, this bitch already longer than the motherfucker. So we finna go ahead and get the video started. On February 15, 2004, two police officers drove down a quiet street in a little English village called Murrow, and they pulled over in front of this little brick bungalow. Earlier that day, a neighbor who lived on the street had called the police to report hearing a strange digging sound coming from inside of this bungalow. And so these officers had been sent out to see what the sound was and make sure the occupants of this home were okay. Now, these two officers were not particularly worried about the occupants of this house. They assumed that some wild animal must have snuck in while the owners were away, and that was all this was. But, as they would quickly learn, that was not the case. After climbing out of their car, the two officers just stopped and listened for a second to see if they could hear this digging sound, but the bungalow was quiet, the street was quiet, and so the two officers shut their car doors and made their way up to the front porch of this bungalow and knocked on the front door. After a few moments, when nobody answered, one of the officers reached down and tried the handle and found it was unlocked. And so he opened the door just a crack and he called out through this opening in the door into the bungalow saying, hey, you know, it's police, we're here to check on you. But when no one called back to them, the officer opened the door the rest of the way and immediately both officers saw there was a huge problem inside of this house. The entire first floor was flooded with several inches of water and they could hear from somewhere in the back of the property the sound of running water. And so again, both officers called out into this house to try to get the attention of anyone who might be inside. And when again, they were met with silence, the officers walked into the flooded house and began walking straight back towards this running water sound. And eventually, after walking through the living room, they entered this hallway that went right to the back of the property. And as soon as they were in it, they could see there was an open door at the end of the hallway on the left. And it seemed like the running water sound was coming out of that room. And so the two officers, one by one, sloshed down this hallway to this room. They turned left, looked inside, and what they saw completely shocked them and immediately sprung them into action. Two months before these officers came to this bungalow and found it flooded with water, the owner of this bungalow, 51-year-old Ronald McClagish, had broken up with his girlfriend. And this breakup was really hard on Ronald. He was already divorced. He was totally broke. He had loads of health issues like bad asthma. He had some liver issues. And just generally, he was someone who was kind of physically frail. And so this girlfriend had been one of the very few good things in his life. And now she was gone and he was alone again. And so very quickly after this breakup, Ronald fell into a very dark depression. And so for six weeks after they broke up, Ronald, for the most part, just stayed in bed and kind of moped around his bungalow, kind of feeling bad for himself. But then finally, at the end of those first six weeks after the breakup, Ronald decided he wanted to get his life back together and just move on. So on February 1st, 2004, so roughly two weeks before those two officers would come to his bungalow because of this digging sound, Ronald would wake up feeling determined to start anew. And the first thing he was going to do was purge his bungalow of anything that was his ex-girlfriend's. She left a lot of things behind when they broke up. She had not collected them. And so now they were just kind of sources of pain. And where most of her stuff was inside of Ronald's bungalow was in this closet in one of the bedrooms at the end of the hall. So that morning, Ronald headed down the hall. He turned left into the bedroom. He opened up the closet. He went inside and with a trash bag in hand, he began rifling through everything in this closet and anything that was hers, he would take it and put it right into the trash bag. And at some point when Ronald was almost done, done pulling done. the last few things of his girlfriend's out and into the trash bag, from behind him, he heard this strange sound coming from the bedroom. It sounded like wood bending or creaking, but before he could turn around to see what the sound was, the door to the closet he was in slammed shut with incredible force, and suddenly Ronald was trapped inside of this closet in total darkness. Now, Ronald was likely shocked at first, 
but he would have reached and tried for the handle and found that no matter what he did, he could not open this closet again. And so Ronald began screaming for help and pounding on the door, but nobody came to help him. The closet that Ronald was in was fairly tall, but it was only two feet wide by about two feet deep, which meant Ronald could only stand inside of this closet. He couldn't sit down, he couldn't bend down. Damn. He literally was trapped standing. And Ronald didn't have water, he didn't have food. He knew that no one was going to be checking on him anytime soon. And even though his bungalow was kind of small and shabby, it was built out of brick. And so the likelihood that his calls for help were penetrating outside loud enough that people could hear them and that they would come in and rescue him was pretty slim. And so at some point that evening, Ronald realized he needed to do something different if he was going to get out of this closet. And so above him were a series of pipes across the ceiling. And so he reached up and he grabbed one of them and he broke it off. Off. He was likely thinking that with this pipe, maybe he can burrow a hole in the wall and crawl through to another room, or maybe he can punch a hole in the door and somehow unlock it, or at a minimum, with the metal pipe, smashing it against the wall or the door would be louder than any noise he could make by yelling. However, the second he broke that pipe off the ceiling, something horrible happened. The pipe he broke was a water pipe. Bang. As soon as it was broken, icy cold water began pouring down directly on top of Ronald's head and face. And again, because he can only stand basically in the middle of this closet, he couldn't get out of the way of this water. It was like he was under a waterfall and couldn't go anywhere. And so he likely tried to ignore the water and tried to use the pipe and screamed and do anything he could to get someone to know he was in here, but no one could hear him. And so it was like he was being tortured with this freezing water and he's in this tight claustrophobic oh, space. Damn. It's total darkness and he's totally panicking. And for days and days, that would be Ronald's nightmarish reality. But despite how terrible his circumstances were, Ronald continued to use that pipe to both smash the walls to make loud sounds. He also began burrowing into the walls, trying to make a hole. But Ronald was getting weaker and weaker. He became very sick. And also, because the water was constantly hitting his head and face, his skin got so saturated that literally his skin started falling off. It basically opened up into Damn. sores and began to sag, and the water just began brushing his skin off. And so finally, after about a week of being trapped in this closet in these terrible conditions, Ronald realized help was not going to come in time, and so he put his pipe down, he kind of slumped up against the wall, and then closed his eyes. Ronald's neighbor, who called the police, actually did hear Ronald using that pipe to try to dig a hole in his wall, and she heard Ronald smashing the pipe on his door, and she must have heard muffled shrieks and yells, but she didn't know what they were and kind of just decided it wasn't her business. But when Ronald's house went from all these strange sounds to silence, that was when she called the police and said, hey, I had heard some digging sounds coming from the bungalow and now I don't. And so when those two police officers arrived at Ronald's bungalow, they went inside, they went down the hallway, they went into the bedroom where Ronald had gone, and they saw this huge wardrobe, which is a big wooden piece of furniture, toppled over right in front of the closet. And at the bottom of the closet, they saw two human feet protruding from underneath that little space at the bottom of the closet. Those feet belonged to Ronald. He had managed to force his feet underneath the closet, but of Somebody course, him he could now. not have fit underneath the closet door. And so the two police officers rushed over and together, they barely were able to get this wardrobe off of the That's closet crazy. door. And when they opened the door up, Ronald was in there, he was deceased, his body was still in a standing position, kind of rigid and propped up against the wall, and freezing water was still pouring down onto his head. It would turn out no one had intentionally trapped Ronald. Instead, his wardrobe was just unstable, and it happened to topple over at the worst possible moment. If you give me just 89 wow. seconds, I'm going to show you this $1 million skill that they were scared to teach you, and how you can use it to get out of the nine- That's crazy. That's crazy. I ain't gonna lie. That's crazy. Right now. On know. Thanksgiving morning in 1900, an 18 year old named Thomas Pedler told his mother that he was going out for a bit, but he'd be back in time for turkey that afternoon. And then he grabbed his jacket and his coat and he headed out the door. 
Thomas lived in a very working class neighborhood in San Francisco, California, where generally speaking, nothing big really ever happened. It was kind of a place where people just worked and that was it. But on this day, something huge was happening in Thomas's neighborhood. The big football game between Stanford University and the University of California was taking place at the stadium in Thomas's district, and they were expecting over 20,000 people to yeah. cram into the stadium. And so Thomas was not about to miss this incredible spectacle, even though he didn't have enough money to buy a ticket but he knew he would find a way to watch this game. And so Thomas leaves his house and he runs to the stadium, which was not far from his house, and he waited in front of the front gate where all these people are streaming in to go into the stadium. And around 11 a.m., Thomas's very close friend, Charles, who was also a young man, made his way to the front gate, the two met up, and at first, their plan was to try to sneak in with the horde of people that were making their way into the stadium. But even though they were still hours away from the opening kickoff of this big game, it was at 2.30 p.m., the stadium was packed. I mean, there was nowhere to sit, there was nowhere to stand. People that had tickets who were going in are looking around thinking, you know, where are we gonna watch this game? And so Thomas and Charles are kind of like, well, what's the point of sneaking in if there's nowhere to watch? And so they decided, okay, we need to find another way to watch this game. And so they began looking around and they noticed there was a huge fence that lined the perimeter of the stadium. And they saw there were some people kind of climbed up on this fence trying to get a view down onto the field. And pretty quickly, when Thomas and Charles decided they would try to do that too, they saw that all the good spots on this fence were already taken. The spots that were open provided no view onto the field. And so that option as well didn't work. And so Thomas and Charles are frustrated. They're starting to worry that they will not see this big game. But when they walked back over to the front gates of the stadium, they happened to notice across the street was this group of people rushing over to this big white brick factory building. And they were literally placing ladders up against the sides of this building and beginning to climb up it. I mean, this is a five-story building and they are just basically free climbing the windows and the fire escapes. And Thomas and Charles realized that the top of this factory was flat and provided a perfect view down onto the field. And so all these people, they're trying to get a good seat to watch this game. And so without any hesitation, Thomas and Charles decide, they're gonna do that too. So they left the stadium, they ran across the street, and they began climbing up the ladders and climbing the windows and the fire escapes until finally they made it onto the roof, 55 feet off the ground. And when they got up there, there wasn't that many people. And so Thomas and Charles were able to run right over to the front edge of this building and claim a spot with an absolutely perfect view of the game. A couple of hours later at 2.30 p.m. when the game actually started, the rooftop that Thomas and Charles were on was now completely packed with people. Hundreds of people have climbed up onto this factory. There were some factory workers never heard below telling people, do not do this. Do not climb on top of this factory. It's not safe. But nobody listened to them. And the police either didn't notice this was happening or they didn't care. And so there's all these people that are on this roof. They're all Thank super you. excited. And the game has begun. It's 2.30. And as soon as the game started, it was like the crowd in the stadium, which could be heard very easily from this rooftop, just kind of erupted. And there were all these bands playing in the stadium. I mean, it was chaos down below. And it really caught on on the roof. All these guys, including Thomas and Charles, they're getting amped about this game. They're singing. They're chanting. They're screaming. They're yelling. I mean, it's total chaos. And Thomas and Charles loved it. But about 20 minutes into the game, as Thomas and Charles are enjoying themselves and the crowd is still going wild, a dull cracking sound could be heard coming from one side of this roof. And so Thomas and Charles, they kind of spun around to see where this cracking sound had come from. Oh, and when they began looking out across the sea of people, they noticed on the far side of the roof where the sound had kind of come from, they could see people scrambling to get off the roof. But before Thomas and Charles and the other people around them who were watching this happening could figure out what was going on, there was a much louder cracking sound and suddenly the floor Clear. underneath Thomas Charles and everybody else 
collapsed. I'll go, and I'll immediately, it. people on this roof fell all the way to the bottom of this factory, 55 feet below. There weren't loads of floors inside of this factory. Instead, it was basically just one big building, 55 feet high, that housed this brick structure right in the center of the factory that was almost as tall as the entire factory. It was almost like the factory was a shell around this brick smaller structure right in the middle that was like 40 feet tall. And so after the ceiling yeah, collapses, hey. Thomas, he falls, but miraculously, he lands on a wooden beam that stretched across the entire factory, like a support beam, and he grabbed onto it, saving himself from falling all the way down. And so Thomas, he only fell maybe five feet, so he was okay, but he didn't have a great grip on this beam. He was holding on, but just barely. And so Thomas, he turns and he's looking around at what's happened below him, and he's hearing people screaming, and he's hearing the sounds of people running around trying to help those who have hit the ground on the bottom. And Thomas immediately begins scanning for Charles. Charles, and he finds him. Charles was one of the other fairly lucky people, at least in Thomas's mind, Charles seemed lucky, because instead of falling from the roof all the way to the ground, Charles and 15 or 20 other people had fallen right onto that brick structure that kind of made up the main part of this factory. And so Charles had only fallen maybe 10 or 15 feet onto the structure. And so Thomas is thinking, oh, Charles and these other people, they've survived this fall, they're okay. However, the second Charles and the others, who supposedly were saved by landing on this brick structure, the second they hit that brick structure, despite not suffering catastrophic injuries like broken bones and horrible internal injuries, these people on the brick structure began letting out these primal screams, these just horrible blood-curdling screams, and as they did, these loud popping sounds began coming out of their body, and then their bodies began contorting forward, almost like a bug rolling up onto itself. It would turn out this factory was not a normal factory. This was a glass factory, and in order to... Oh shit. Make glass, you need to heat sand and some other chemicals up to extraordinarily high temperatures. You need a furnace that can literally burn hotter than lava. And so that brick structure that was housed in the middle of this five story tall factory was a glass furnace and it was on. And so even though the inside of this furnace was the hottest place, it was over 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the outside of this furnace where Charles and the others had landed, believing they were saved from this 55 foot fall to their death, was still extremely hot, so hot, that the factory workers couldn't even go near the furnace, even with special equipment on. The way they worked with this furnace was with these long metal pokers. They would work the flames and the glass at a distance. Ooh, and so the instant that Charles and the others landed on the top of this furnace, they began to light on fire. Those snapping sounds that were coming out of their bodies was, was the sound of them instantly igniting on fire. And so Thomas and the others who had initially survived this horrible collapse watched as Charles and the others shrieked and shrieked and their bodies continued to contort and they continued to burn and smolder and Charles actually he would roll up so tightly that his body began to roll down the curved side of this furnace and at some point his body slipped into a crack in the furnace and he actually fell into the flames inside at which point he went silent around the time that Charles and the others stopped shrieking a number of people just just out on the road, heard the commotion, and they came inside, and one of them was Thomas's father. And in a terrible twist of fate, he actually looked up and saw his son clinging to the beam, Thomas, except it was so hot inside of this factory that Thomas was sweating, he was losing his grip, it was really hard to hold on to this beam, and his father watched as Thomas lost his grip and fell the 10 more feet down onto the furnace exterior. He landed feet first, then he fell onto his stomach and his face. He immediately ignited on fire, began shrieking, and then went silent. All told, 23 people would be killed during this roof collapse, and dozens and dozens more would be horribly injured and disfigured. This collapse goes down as one of the very worst disasters in sports history. However, I did my first time ever hearing about that right here. I ain't never heard about this story right here.
or on this day, oh, wow. the crowd inside the stadium was so caught up in the game that they actually didn't notice this horrible tragedy taking place just a hundred feet away from where they were. It wasn't until the end of the game when the winning team's fans carried their players in this kind of spontaneous parade out of the stadium to celebrate that they walked out onto the street and saw all these burnt up, rolled up corpses of the people who had landed on the furnace. Is insurance way too expensive? Uh, you sure you want to I never heard that story. I see people like, paying like, over one hundred dollars for COVID. I just watched the game, man. That's crazy, man. R.I.P. for real. In April of 1979, a 69-year-old woman named Monica Myers was appointed mayor of a little village called Betterton in the U.S. state of Maryland. Betterton used to be this very fancy resort town on the water where people from Baltimore and Philadelphia would come there for vacations. They had fancy hotels and restaurants and shops. But by the time Monica became Betterton's mayor, Betterton had kind of gone downhill. People had stopped coming to Betterton. All the hotels shut down or were abandoned or burned down. The summer homes of the rich people from the big cities, those got sold off. And down at the beach, all these glamorous boardwalks literally just kind of crumbled into the sea. And in their place were all these shanty towns where homeless people set up their camps. But Monica had grown up in Betterton, and so she really loved the town and wanted to improve it. And so when she became mayor in 1979, she really leaned into her new role way more than other mayors would. Instead of managing the village from an office, like most mayors would do, Monica literally went out in town and just began doing lots of jobs around the town for free. She would ride around with the police and literally stop crimes in action. One time, she stumbled across someone looting a vacant hotel, and she personally got out, chased this person down, and made them put everything back that they had taken. She would pick up trash on the beach, she would do random repairs on people's homes and businesses all over town, and sometimes she would just go door to door asking people how they were doing. And so very quickly, the people of Betterton really grew to love Monica, and they loved seeing her every mail, single bro. day just out and about making Betterton a better place. And so, on March 20th, 1980, roughly one year into Monica's tenure as mayor, it was immediately noticeable to the people of Betterton when Monica was nowhere to be seen. That day, she did not go to the police station in the morning like she normally did. She was not seen at the beach doing her trash pickup, and she didn't knock on anybody's door. And so by mid-morning that day, the people of Betterton, all 120 of them, were basically out in force looking for Monica. And at 11.30 a.m., the police in Betterton got a call about Monica. It was this guy who was totally panicked, he could barely make a sentence, and he basically just told the police, you gotta get here now, and so the police hopped in their cars, and they sped to the address this guy gave them, and when they got there, they saw it was this very plain, boxy building that was kind of tucked back in the woods, it was far away from the town center, and really, nobody ever went over here, and the police, when they parked their cars, they saw the guy who had called the police, the distraught caller, was standing outside of the front door, he was obviously crying, and he was waiting for them to come over and follow him into this building. And so the police got out of their cars, they ran over to this guy, and they're asking him, you know, what happened? Where's Monica? What's going on? But this guy was so hysterical, he really could not describe what happened to Monica. He just kept telling them to come on, come on, follow me. And so he led them into this building, and pretty quickly they entered this huge warehouse where all across the ceiling were these big metal catwalk areas that kind of zigged and zagged all over this warehouse and below them all over the floor were these huge industrial sized 15 foot tall vats that contained something and so this guy who had led police here he stops and he just points at the nearest vat and so the police picking up his cue begin walking towards this vat and as they got closer and closer they were hit with this horrible smell that made them gag and cough and before long they had to stop and kind of compose themselves. The smell was so bad. 
It would turn out this building that was kind of removed from the town center of Betterton was Betterton's sewage treatment plant. And that morning, Monica had gone to the treatment plant to help clean some of these 15 foot tall industrial sized vats that contained human waste. She had done this enough times that when she was here, she did not need any supervision. And so that morning she was alone. She climbed up onto one of the catwalks over one of these big vats and she had reached down with her testing kit to test the sewage to see how much cleaning it would need. And as she did that, she somehow slipped and fell into the big vat of human waste. Now, she would not have immediately gone under. It was not like a liquid. It was more like clay or really thick mud, where at first she would have kind of been laying on top of the sewage. But as soon as she tried to move to get out of the sewage, the sewage would have functioned more like quicksand, where as soon as a part of her body went under the surface, it would not come up again. And so after the police composed themselves, they climbed up onto the catwalk and they looked down and they saw Monica, who was face down, partially submerged inside of the spat, and she was deceased. Her autopsy would reveal that she died of drowning, which means she literally inhaled human waste. Oh, these crazy, these stories were crazy, right? I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna even lie, like, most of these stories were crazy in the motherfucker, man. Anyway, man, I'm glad that he bought this, um, these, uh, three places you can't go back stories, you know, so he need to, he need to do about, about, like, two, three or more of these, and then got down, start back on, you know what I'm saying, the long video. <laughs> oh, y'all think it's a video I ain't react to, came out? Not last week, I read that one, I think. It was the one, I think the week before that one, it's a video that came out. I seen that I ain't react to. I looked at it yet. I'm gonna react to that bit. That been long too. But anyway, give me a thumbs up, like, subscribe, see how motherfuckers on that video. Let's ride, nigga. <laughs>